There's nothing like faithfulness. And we live in a day and age of great infidelity, of great unfaithfulness. God is looking for faithful people, people who will not only be faithful unto death, but faithful to the Word of God, faithful to see that the teaching that is taught in a church lines up with the plumb line of the Word of God. We're going to see that today as we study the letter to the church at Pergamum. As Jesus begins his message to the church at Pergamum in Revelation chapter 2, verse 12, he describes himself as being the one who has the sharp, two-edged sword. When he does that, remember, he's going to relate who he is to something that is going on in that church. And this time, when he describes himself, he's not describing himself in a way that is going to cause them to find comfort, but in a way that is going to reprove them. He wants them to remember that he is the living Word of God. And out of the living Word of God comes the sharp, two-edged sword, the Word of God. Let's look at it. Revelation chapter 2, verse 12. And to the angel of the church in Pergamum write, the one who has the sharp, two-edged sword says this, I know where you dwell, where Satan's throne is, and you hold fast my name, and you do not deny my faith, even in the days of Antipas, my witness, my faithful one, who was killed among you, where Satan dwells. He says, but I have a few things against you, because you have there some who hold. Now watch the word teaching, and I would take and circle that word, who have that hold the teaching of Balaam. I would probably circle it in black, because it's ungodly teaching, it's wrong teaching, it's teaching that goes against the word of God. You have some there who hold the teaching of Balaam, who keep teaching, circle it again, Balak, to put a stumbling block before the sons of Israel, to eat things sacrificed to idols, and to commit acts of immorality. What on earth was going on in that church at Pergamum? Well, what was going on was they were allowing wrong teaching, teaching that would even lead the saints to commit acts of immorality. He says, thus you have also some who in the same way hold the teaching, circle it again, of the Nicolaitans. And then what does he say? He says, repent. He told the church at Ephesus to repent because they had left their first love. He's telling the church at Pergamum to repent because they're allowing the wrong teaching in the church. The church in Smyrna, the church that was suffering, he never told them to repent. They didn't have to repent. And they didn't have to repent because they were walking in fidelity to the Word of God and to the person of God. And they were so sold out to God and so purified by suffering that they were willing to be faithful even if it cost them their lives, even if they would have tribulation 10 days, even if they would die in the midst of that tribulation because they knew that they had a crown of life. You know, a suffering church is usually a pure church, but a church that does not suffer has problems in it. And one of the problems, or the major problem in Pergamum was the kind of teaching that they were receiving. This is why Jesus defines himself, describes himself as the one who has the sharp two-edged sword. Now, that ought to ring a bell. And what I'd like you to do is write down three verses next to verse 12, and let's look at them. They're all in the book of Revelation. Let's go to chapter 1, verse 16, and let's see how Jesus is described in the state of his awesome glory and radiance. In verse 16, it says, And in his right hand he, ha he held seven stars, and out of his mouth came a sharp, two-edged sword, and his face was like the sun shining in his strength. Out of his mouth comes the sharp two-edged sword. Now go to chapter 2, verse 16. He says, Repent, therefore, or else 
I am coming to you quickly and I will make war against them with the sword of my mouth. In other words, those that are teaching wrong, I'm going to fight against them and I'm going to fight against them with the sword that comes out of my mouth. Now, what is that sword? Well, let's go to the third verse I want you to look at and that's Revelation chapter 19, verse 15. Revelation chapter 19 and it's verse 15. And Revelation 19 is talking about Jesus' second coming. It's talking about how he's clothed in verse 13 in a robe dipped in blood. And his name is called the Word of God. And it says, and the armies which followed him are in heaven, clothed, that's us, they're in heaven, clothed with fine linen, white and clean. They were following him on, his white, on white horses and from his mouth, comes a sharp sword so that with it he may smite the nations and he will rule them with a rod of iron and he treads the winepress of the fierce wrath of God Almighty. And on his robe and on his thigh he has a name written, King of Kings and Lord of Lords. What is this sharp sword that comes out of his mouth? Well, I want us to look at two other verses. And the first one I want us to look at is Hebrews chapter 4. And I want you to look at verse 12. For the word of God is alive, it's living, and it is active, and it is sharper than any two-edged sword, piercing as far as the division of soul and spirit. In other words, it exposes what's going on between the soul and between the spirit of both joints and marrow. It divides just like that and is able to judge the thoughts and the intentions of the heart. Now I want you to go to Ephesians chapter 6 and I want you to go to Ephesians because in Ephesians he's talking about the armor of God and how we're to put on the armor of God. Then it talks about the one and only offensive weapon that any child of God needs and that's in Ephesians chapter 6 and it's verse 17. And he says, and take the helmet of salvation and the sword of the Spirit, which is the Word of God. The sword of the Spirit, which is the Word of God. So when Jesus comes and He says, I'm going to fight against you, He's going to fight against those in the church that are teaching things that are contrary to His Word. He's going to fight against the nations and He's going to render them as nothing with that sharp two-edged sword that comes out of the Word of, out of the mouth of God, out of the mouth of the Word of God. In the beginning was the Word and the Word was with God and the Word was God. So what I want you to see is he talks to this church. He's telling them, I am happy with you and I commend you because of your faith. I commend you because you have not denied the faith. You have not denied my word. But then I'm reproving you and I'm reproving you because of this wrong teaching that you are tolerating that you have there, that you have allowed to be in the church. Now, you have to understand that this is not doctrinal differences. This is not a difference between those that may believe in predestination and those that say, well, I believe in free will. This is not a doctrinal difference between those who believe you can lose your salvation and those who believe in eternal security. This is and a teaching that goes directly against the word of God. And it is the teaching of Balaam. It's the teaching of Balaam who in turn, who in turn kept teaching Balak to put a stumbling block before the children of Israel. Now Balaam was a prophet that was hired by Balak 
who was a king, who was afraid of the children of Israel. He saw them and he saw their victories and he saw how they had defeated their enemies. So in the book of Numbers, in Numbers 22 and Numbers 23 and 24, in those chapters in Numbers, we see Balak, the king, hiring Balaam and asking Balaam to please come and curse the children of God because he believes that if he can get him to pronounce a curse, then God's children will be cursed. Now, you hear people and they say, oh, I'm afraid of curses or somebody's put a curse on me. I want to tell you something. Balaam could not put a curse on the children of God and he couldn't put a curse on the children of God because God had blessed them. And no one can put a curse on you because God has blessed you. Ephesians chapter 1 verse 3 says, Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who has blessed us with every spiritual blessing in heavenly places in Christ Jesus, just as He chose us in Him, in Christ, before the foundation of the world, so that we might be adopted as sons of God. And the enemy and the world cannot curse the child of God and have it amount to anything. As a matter of fact, the curses will turn back on them, but they will not come against you. So you need not fear that. And you need not fear that simply from studying about Balak trying to get Balaam. Every time Balaam, and he wanted to curse him because Balak was going to pay him good money. I mean, Balak, Balaam was a prophet for hire. By the way, uh, Balaam's name means a, uh, a devourer of people. Balaam means a devourer of people. So Balaam wanted to devour these people, and he wanted to devour these people because he was greedy, because he wanted the prophet that would come from cursing the children of God. But every time he opened his mouth to curse the children of God, every time he tried to do that, he couldn't succeed. Instead, out of his mouth come the most incredible blessings. I mean, you wouldn't believe that this renegade prophet for hire could be, could say such awesome words and make such beautiful promises to the children of Israel. But they did come out of his mouth because every time he opened it to a curse, instead he blessed the children of God. When Balaam couldn't succeed in cursing the children of God, then he devised another way to get to God's people and to bring God's judgment on them, even as you see God's judgment threatening those who are teaching this wrong doctrine. We'll talk about it when we come back after this important announcement. Welcome back, my friend. You know, while you were listening to that announcement, I thought, I think they need to go to the book of Numbers and see this important statement that you cannot curse something that God has blessed. So let's look at it. It's Numbers chapter 23, and it's verse 8. How shall I curse whom God has not cursed? How can I denounce what the Lord has not denounced? You cannot do it. And so that's why blessing came out of Balaam's mouth instead of cursing. But now, he couldn't get to them through curses, but he could get to them another way and bring God's judgment on them. If he could seduce them to eat things sacrificed to idols, if he could seduce them to commit acts of immorality, then God would have to judge them because those are direct uh, 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 acts of disobedience against the Word of God, against the commandments of God. So watch what happens. I want to take you to Numbers chapter 25. In Numbers chapter 25, it says in verse 1, While Israel remained at Shittim, the people began to play the harlot with the daughters of Moab. For they invited the people the daughters of Moab invited the Jews to the sacrifices of their gods, and the people ate 
and bowed down to their gods. So Israel joined themselves to Baal of Peor, and the Lord was angry against Israel. And the Lord said, take all the leaders of the people and execute them in broad daylight before the Lord, so that the fierce anger of the Lord may be turned away from Israel. God watches over his word to perform it. And if you and I do not obey, you and I need to understand that not only will that sharp sword come out and judge the world and judge the nations, but it will judge the church also. Because as 1 Peter says, judgment begins at the house of God. And if it begins at the house of God, what then are the righteous going to do? And what then is the world going to do? So we, knowing that judgment begins at the house of God, knowing that because we know the word or because we have access to the word, then we're accountable to the word and we have to obey it. Well, I want to take us to one more verse that will just kind of seal it. And that's in Numbers chapter 31. And in Numbers chapter 31, in verse 15, Moses is speaking to the people. Now, Balaam has already died. And he says, and Moses said to them, have you spared all the women? He says, behold, these cause the sons of Israel through the counsel of Balaam to trespass against the Lord in the matter of Peor. So the plague was among the congregation of the Lord. In other words, judgment came because what happened was, although the curses could not come out of Balaam's mouth, he could teach the people and he could teach the people, uh, the daughters of the Moabites, to seduce the men and to get them to eat things sacrificed to idols and to get them to commit acts of immorality. As a matter of fact, if you go back to Numbers chapter 25, in verse 6 it says, Then behold, one one of the sons of Israel came and brought to his relatives a Midianite woman in the sight of Moses and in the sight of all the congregation of the sons of Israel while they were weeping at the doorway of the tent of meeting. And when Phinehas, the son of Eleazar, the son of Aaron, the priest saw, he arose from the midst of the congregation and took a spear in his hand. And he went in after the man of Israel into the tent and pierced both of them through the man of Israel and the woman through the body, so the plague of the sons of Israel was checked, and those who died by the plague were 24,000. What was that guy taking that woman into his tent for? It was taking that woman into his tent to commit an act of immorality. You say, what is immorality? Immorality is sex outside of marriage. It is sex outside of marriage. If you're living with another person and you're sleeping with them and you're not married to them, that's an act of immorality. If you are involved in homosexuality, lesbianism, or adultery, God calls all of those not a, a character, but it call, a, a, a character of, of a person, but he calls it sin. It is sin. It is transgression against his holy law. Incest is transgression against his holy law. And so he's saying that these things, these are acts of immorality, and acts of immorality must be judged. Hebrews 13 says, Marriage is honorable in all, and the bed undefiled, but fornicators and adulterers God will judge. And so what Jesus is saying to the church at Pergamum is this. Listen, this is what I have against you. I am reproving you because of this. I have commended you. We'll look at that commendation later. But I have this against you. I am reproving you because you are allowing teaching. Now listen, the teachings of Balaam, who kept teaching Balak to put a stumbling block before the sons of Israel to eat things sacrificed to idols and to commit acts of immorality. 
And he says, thus you have also some who in the same way hold the teaching of the Nicolaitans. Now, what is the teaching of the Nicolaitans? Well, there's much debate about what the teaching of the Nicolaitans is. Some say Irenaeus, who was an early church father, said that the teaching of, of, um, uh, of the Nicolaitans was that, uh, that you can live any way that you want. Want. They said that he was a follower, uh, that they became followers of Nicholas. Nicholas is mentioned in Acts chapter 6, verse 5. And Nicholas is one of the ones that was chosen to be a deacon, to minister to others. And church history tells us that he apostatized. And when he apostatized, he taught unrestrictive indulgence indulgence. Others say that this was a sect that began by a statement by Nicholas that also indulged the flesh and became an early sect of the Gnostics. The Gnostics were the ones that were caught up in knowledge and thought knowledge was everything and it didn't matter how you lived and they thought that they had a superior revelation from God. Or there's a third view and the third view is taking the word Nicolaitans. Nikos, which means to conquer, and Laos, which means people. So Nicolaitans would be to conquer the people. Now remember, he commended the church in Ephesus. And he says, I am pleased with you because you hate the deeds of the Nicolaitans, which I also hate. Now, whichever it is, we know that it's wrong to indulge the flesh and it's wrong to teach that. But when we look at Balaam and his name, which means conquer or, or devour of the people, and then we look at Nicolaus, which means to conquer the people, it seems that the doctrine of the Nicolaitans could also be that hierarchy that puts certain people in the church in a superior position where they forget, as First Peter says, says that we are all a kingdom of priests unto God and that we are to live a righteous life and that we are to hold forth the word of life and, and we are to live in a righteous way. Let's just take a quick moment and let's look at that scripture in 1 Peter chapter 2. In 1 Peter chapter 2 and verse 5, and remember he calls them a kingdom and priests unto God in Revelation 1. And he says in verse 5, you also as living stones are being built up into a spiritual house for a holy priesthood to offer up spiritual sacrifices acceptable to God through Jesus Christ. He goes on to say in verse 9 that you are a chosen race, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, a people for God's own possession, that you may proclaim the excellencies of him who has called you out of darkness into his marvelous light. And he says, I urge you as aliens and strangers to abstain from fleshly lusts which wage war against the soul and keep your behavior excellent among the Gentiles so that in the thing that they slander you as evildoers, they may an account of your good deeds as they observe them glorify God in the day of visitation. Beloved, we're not finished with this message to the church at Pergamum, but you have enough for today that you know that you must watch what teaching is taught in the church. Oh, beloved, the email that we're going to look at today is a problem that is becoming more and more exacerbated in the times in which we're living. It's from a mother, and she says, we have recently been told by our 41-year-old son that he is gay. It is such devastating news. He's a former youth pastor and has always loved the Lord so much. He's also won many to Christ. He says he still loves the Lord, but is no longer in church because he feels rejected there. He's a professor in the Chicago area and says he's searching for a church which is more accepting. And then she goes on to say, he has told us because he wants to communicate with us, but I don't know how to communicate with him. 
him. What do I do? What books can I read? Well, I think that the most important thing to do is to thank God that he has told you that he is gay, that he's felt that freedom or he's felt that release. And that's the beginning of your talking point. And I think your talking point is to get him to say why he feels that he is gay, why he feels that he is turned to another man or to men for sexual satisfaction. And as he tells you this, don't, don't panic. Just listen and let him talk. Many times when we talk, we begin to see the fallacy of our ways. And the thing that you have going for your son is the fact that he has been in youth work, the fact that he does know the Word of God. What he's tried to do is twist the Word of God. He's telling you that he's missing church, that he's missing that relationship, and he wants to feel accepted. And sin always separates and he has to understand this. So I would get him to talk to me. I would say, let's look at the scriptures. And after he talks, let him talk, then let's look at the scriptures and say, what do the scriptures say? Now, is, is gay, is being gay, is being homosexual, is that something that you're born with? Or does God call it a sin? And you're going to see that God calls it a sin. And if it's a sin, then there's a cure for sin. And that cure for sin is being truly born again and set free. You can have homosexual desires as a child of God, but you don't carry them out because a child of God has the power to say no to sin. So I would get in conversations. I would talk to him. I would tell him that I love him unconditionally and that I just want to understand with him what God's Word says.